Um, for the first approach, there was, for instance, here one exercise that I've led in the last years, which was a global habitat mapping, where I essentially used the, the IOCN habitat type map mentioned earlier, integrated uh, best available data on land cover, land use, climate topography, as well as using here essentially the Copernicus global land cover layer as a backbone. This is from the Buchon et al. paper in MDPI. And we also created together with the notes group here some of the first global depiction on forest management, which we also used in this vegetation mapping exercise. All of this data is um, openly available and mapped at two different hierarchical levels. So we have a level one layer, a level two layer, has been mapped at 100 meter in the 20, from 2015 to 2019. Main limitation in 2019 was that the Buchon et al. data essentially stopped by then. But as I was informed, there is a new land cover backbone that is upcoming that will replace it. And at that point, I'm very happy also to make like an update for the, for the um, existing habitat map, as well as I'm currently working on some region applications for similar approaches too. Um, one thing I also want to mention, and I know this is, comes maybe controversial because we all like our big global maps, but I really would like to highlight also the value beyond the global scale, because often what we see is when you, you produce a map, you show it to some people in some local rec regions, and they zoom in and behind their backyard and saying, oh, this pixel is wrong, why is that, right? And then suddenly all the trust in the map is lost. And I really want to emphasize that often it can be much more beneficial to actually develop regional estimates of land cover and also habitat and vegetation types, because then you can control the context and the local situation to um, these particular circumstances. To um, one example which I'm currently working on, and this is work in progress, so you unfortunately won't see much result in here, but I can show you a bit like what I'm, how it's actually being done. This is a regional vegetation mapping approach that is situated in the Austrian-Hungarian border, I and mean, it's a close collaboration with local administration and experts. And here I'm using essentially lots of unpublished, non-publicly available uh, regional vegetation surveys by the local communities, by the local state, to essentially parameterize uh, vegetation mapping with a very detailed uh, legend. I'm using um, deep learning approaches and a lot of uh, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 uh, data, which I have essentially prepared from 2017 to the present. I've been usually radiometrically and surface reflectance corrected, lots of filtering being done and monthly aggregates. I mean, seriously, a lot of work already on that, but as I hear this also soon from Open Earth Monitor, um, a lot of prepared layers for that, so that will obviously become easier. Mythologically, um, this case study is super challenging because um, in the rare region we have many vegetation types which are actually not forests, forests of no relevance almost there, but rather it's more very lowland, grassland community types and also reed vegetation, wetland vegetation, and most critically, some of the habitats of the greatest conservation oh, concern uh, is, uh, are essentially uh, these soda ponds which occur there, and these actually are very ephemeral, which meaning during the course of the year, they frequently appear and disappear. They completely dry out, and then in the next couple of days, they suddenly appear again. If you run a standard random forest, whatever algorithm over those, you will probably get a very diffuse pixel mixture between crest and wetland there, because it's literally impossible uh, due to the ephemeral nature of that to make an accurate lineation of this. But this is essentially one of the core reasons why the entire national park was established in the area, so mapping those accurately is a major challenge. And as you can see on the right, this is some of the crosswalks and the, uh, uh, the final legend that we're effectively using with the UNIS habitat, habitat vegetation types where we distinguish between different plant communities in the region and mapping them essentially as close as possible to um, the uh, annex habitats that occur in the region. Um, mythologically, again, uh, to me, is always time is a bigger elephant in the room than space. We have lots of high-resolution maps, but to me, the temple dimension is the really critical and the hard bit. Um, there has been, for instance, here this really interesting um, paper and review from Pelletier et al., which proposed essentially a temporal uh, deep learning algorithm, TEMCNN, which is similar to SIT's approach, that uh, shows you very, uh, in my opinion, very elegantly what the difference between different approaches are if we have temporal data. One can take, for instance, across the entire domain, take all the spatial data you have across multiple time periods, such as months, and combine them all into one output. Equally, you can just go backwards and ignore the rest of the spectral dimension. You can go spectrally up and down, or in an early word, you combine them all together. But 
this of course again ignores the spatial patterns in this switch, particularly for these soda pans, but also for other um, key crescent habitats in our area are really the critical bit because otherwise you get a lot of salt and pepper um, classifications. Um, the approach that uh, is currently being established in that is actually an approach that um, I found a couple of vignettes online. These are really hard to implement, this is, but still, in my opinion, is the state of the art for any deep learning approaches. This was an approach based by Garnot and Lantriot, established in uh, France, where they tested this extensively on crop tap mapping. And to my information, it's still in the top three of any validated uh, crop tap identification at the Sentinel and Sentinel-1 application. It works essentially as a unit spatial classifier that takes a series of temporal stacks across spectral bands, passes them to a classical convolutional blocks as is typical from a unit's signature. However, there is this one slight addition which you can see here at the bottom, which is essentially a temporal attentation mask that basically informs across the different unit levels and the convolutional levels the previous uh, temporal states that you're informed with. And therefore, you can essentially convolute the entire stack of, let's, let's say, in my case, 12 monthly images into one final annual image at once. So it's a true spatial temporal prediction in a sense, where you condense a lot of the information into a final prediction. At that point, I would really like to show you some maps. However, uh, I have these maps only yet recently, very early troubleshoot on that, and not to mention I have a few stakeholders in the regions which actually gave me new training data <laughs> just two weeks ago, so I might need to rerun the entire thing again. And um, these algorithms are super intensive to run. I mean, without a GPU, you will probably not do much there because it takes ages, so it's, it's really... Um, yeah, a work in progress, but so far um, I think it's, it's getting in the right direction, particularly um, when I compare that, for instance, for some off-the-shelf XJ boost or like existing land cover maps, I could really see that some of the habitats uh, flagged in the region popping much more out. Moving out to, from the actual to the potential vegetation, and here I'm taking also a lot of work that has been done by Tom and also by other people in the Open Earth Consortium, Potential natural vegetation is this very interesting concept which actually dif distinguishes between different types of vegetation types. When we're thinking of potential natural, we can think of potential managed. So what would be if you manage the land somewhere? What would be the vegetation there? Or how would it be in a natural succession state? And we can also compare that, of course, to an actual natural state as well as an actual managed state. This has been very beautifully outlined in this uh, paper by Tom in the past. Um, these maps, they might seem a bit hypothetical often because you don't know what you're referring to, but I can assure you they are of tremendous potential for many uh, land potential assessments, degradation assessments, but also restoration assessments. There, for instance, this work that our group has published a few years ago, which was essentially about uh, global restoration priority mapping for biodiversity conservation. We are, have been working on a similar approach for Europe in recent years, and this work will also be expanded now in the context of the nature restoration law, where it comes down a lot to, okay, where do we store what and to what state, and where actually do you want to go? What is the upper potential level? What is the current and from where to where do you restore something. <clears throat> um, on a basic principle level, how does PNV mapping work? Well, it is actually very similar to Earth observation, classical correlative data-driven uh, mapping. The key distinction, however, is that usually you consider only the biophysical components, ignoring any of these classical Earth observation components that really drive your um, prediction and have a response towards management, such as land use and so forth. And you try to pick essentially training data that reflect the most undisturbed pieces of land, and uh, as well as for the covariates, and then it becomes like a typical um, correlative mapping. And at this point, I really would like to highlight this work by Julia, who uh, was working together with Tom at uh, Open GeoHub. And uh, yeah, I mean, her, her work that she led here was really amazing. And I, I just want to make really clear that my role in this was like very minor, but I think it's, it's really um, outstanding that she did. And I just wanted to highlight a bit what uh, her approach to this problem was. She, in the part of Open Earth Monitor, made essentially a global land potential assessment using the fraction of photosynthetically active uh, radiation of FAPA and predicted that at monthly steps at 250 meter resolution globally. 
the approach was essentially simulated data from low lumen pressure uh, using uh, FAPA data, also climate data, topography, lithology, and overall this is in, amounted to an impressive 1.5 terabyte of covariate data that she processed for all of this. So it, this was really a tremendous effort that I think also um, was overall quite satisfactory even from the predictive performance and using all the data of course is already owed up and the manuscript as well. So if you haven't been aware of this work and part of OpenMERS Monitor, then please have a look at it. So what do you get out of it? You get global maps of, this is just an average map over the, the whole period of the actual FAPA, of the potential FAPA, as well as the deviance and the difference between them. Does it work? Yeah quite easily. So basically here you can see different three case studies between Brazil, Colombia and Ethiopia and uh, summarized here on the right essentially is a time series where the blue line is the potential FAPA which naturally stays relatively stable uh, with exception of some photosynthetic uh, fluctuations and the red line being the actual FAPA which is of course driven by for instance here land use changes in the Amazon. So you can really see how you can use these differentiate layers for making any land potential assessments. However, of course, and here I come, uh, which what I believe is actually Tom's last uh, data of work before he went a full-time manager of his <laughs> work. <laughs> but <laughs> this was work uh, the, that we did a few while ago uh, as part of um, the Nature Map project, where we also tried to do a potential natural vegetation mapping globally. But here we didn't predict like continuous vegetation, so photosynthetically continuous, but rather we tried to predict explicit categories, so multinominal approach. This was again using 17 classes globally, used a lot of data from soil cores and undisturbed uh, layers, as well as um, basically an ensemble machine learning approach. The data is also openly available, and I've seen people using them in the past, probably because there's no other layer existing for similar circumstances. Um, the benefit of this sort of mapping, you can see the result on the left, is of course that similar as I showed you before with the ISCN habitat mapping where we integrate a lot of different data sources, we can use these potential natural vegetation maps and actually translate them into the same legend and the same thematic distinction as we're using for some of these integrated um, biodiversity mapping approach, these habitat mapping approach that I showed you earlier. So and I've used, for instance, Tom's map here to translate it in these potential habitats that basically take the same classes and transfer them there. However, um, with, of course, this was also one first exercise, and since then, basically, we tried, tried to also build a little bit on it and extend it a bit regionally. This is, for instance, one key factor is when you look in Europe is, of course, that uh, much of the potential natural vegetation that we would see here in terms of categorical level is mostly forest. You see no, almost no other classes, although you could of course use the individual probabilities. However, when you think of a potential natural vegetation concept, it's often a quite uncertain thing, right? So you might have a cropland in a place and the cropland could easily develop into wetland, but it could also develop into forest. In many cases, it might be equally likely. So in that sense, uh, rather than distinguishing between a multinominal, multi-categorical prediction, you could equally just simplify it in a very ordinary uh, predictive approach. I tried to do just that quite recently. This is from a European potential natural vegetation mapping, where I essentially used uh, lots of natural vegetation data from the EA, from GBIL, from SPLOT. There is a database on, I uh, think, that the University of Wageningen also used to make some actual vegetation mapping and essentially try to predict like a uh, um, PNV for Europe with a climate lithology with geographic density and landforms and so forth. I used a uh, similar an ensemble. I, um, one approach here maybe is that I used um, Bayesian machine learning, so Bayesian additive regression trees, which are quite cool because you can actually get a full posterior out of that. So you can literally make like a lower, median, and upper probability in any given place estimate. And also, uh, based, since we are mapping them individually, you can really nicely uh, compare them to essentially transition rules to uh, contemporary land use. Preprint of that is open, it's currently in review, and the data is also already on Sinodo if anyone is interested. Um, how does it look like? What you see on the left is essentially an assessment that uses the output from this PNV mapping as essentially the most likely potential natural vegetation in any given state, departing from the current vegetation and land use classes. This uses essentially the, a similar backbone that Linda uses as part of her work as an underlying state and essentially, okay, what is the most likely transition that one would have if we're taking the current existing land use system? 
and try to move from there. And you can even uh, estimate a rough challenge of transitioning to this potential natural vegetation state. This is, of course, just a very rough analysis. This is no way that it actually might come that way. It is just that, okay, well, if we think of a natural transition, this could be one potential trajectory, how it might turn out, but others might also be possible. And uh, these data might help you explore that. Another quick thing that I did was also, um, since it's essentially a predictive model, we could treat it like any other predictive model that is often used with these correlative approaches, climatic data we have for various SSPs, we can project them forward in terms of the climatically suitable area, and this obviously also results in some slight changes for different SSPs. It's quite interesting to me, for instance, that overall across all scenarios we see that the suitable areas for forest, grasslands, and marine inlets tends to increase, while for instance, sparsely vegetated areas and wetlands are becoming, at least from a suitable land to land potential assessment, becoming much more rarer in Europe. Which, um, if you think about it, yeah, it gets warmer, the tree line is shifting upwards elevation, you might have more trees and more CO2 fertilization, and at the same time, precipitation patterns often change, therefore affecting the occurrences of wetlands. So to come last, my last slide, and this is more like a little bit of brain fart from my side, because I think in terms of the frontiers and vegetation mapping, um, I personally think we're spending too much time on spatial resolution. We should think a lot more on thematic and temporal resolution. Even in the work that I've showed you before, there basically many times was only like five, six or ten classes, but there are, if you really want to go into full legends, there are vegetation legends out with over 100 different vegetation classes, and there's training data for that if you really dig hard enough. So it's really an effort we can make to make this really more specific. Uh, data sets harmonizing. So far, every single PNV data prediction that I'm aware of has used different training data for some reason. We all use different things. There's no harmonized database of some sort for these things available in Europe, not even workflows, how to put them all together. And mythologically, of course, uh, as I showed before, like some of these spatial temporal predictions have quite good promise. And one approach, I mean, this is more like for me the techy uh, uh, interested folks, but there's a recent paper that has these really cool um, so-called physics and from neural networks where you essentially merge a correlative prediction with a hybrid process-based uh, equation. And what that would allow, for instance, in a PNV context, you can literally put an equation in there that estimates the growth of vegetation over time and put that as a neuron directly in the prediction together with the data-driven one. So basically combining the best of both worlds. So, but... That's it for me, and thank you for the audience. I'm a little bit over time, but as I heard from Katya, um, I can spend a little more on questions. <laughs>